From the intersection of 218 and 80, with rivers like our own, secrecies they never find. I'm Aaron McNabb. Maybe in the and 70s, yes. where there's this movement to, to make um, secondary education or college education like more commonplace for the United uh-huh. States. So, uh-huh. so state universities became a thing and um, student loan financing became a thing so that more and more people went to college, uh, but, but also oftentimes were accruing a lot of student debt. And then as right. a result of that bubble, tuitions went way up. Mm-hmm. And um, so there are a lot of United States citizens who are benefited greatly from that because they're, you know, literate and you know at least semi-educated uh but also in many cases uh, united states citizens are very um resentful towards academia as a result of that because there was a sort of false promise of job security or job promise and and right. you know all of this stuff so people are uh, a lot of people are really skeptical of academia as a result of that i don't know if you have any analogs for that in russia any skepticism towards academic learning or anything like that uh there's skepticism of a different kind but the system is completely different and uh uh, you know the frustrations are very different it's sort of the opposite because uh higher education is public free um i mean you can so there's like uh you do need to pass you pass a test when you finish school sort of like gd whatever acronym you have gde yeah, GED, general GED, ed- ed- yeah. Ed- education diploma or something like that. So we, you get that, you get a score after you uh, finish high school, and then that score allows you to, if it's high enough, allows you to enter a really good university, if it's a little lower than a shittier one, and uh, so forth. And so if you study, uh, you can get somewhere. You could get into some university, maybe not the best one, but uh, into some uh, university for free. And moreover, for men, um, this is something you really want to do because if you don't, then you may be drafted into the army because the service is mandatory. And so that, uh, with, with, with girls, you know, there's not that kind of direct threat that you try to avoid by going to the school, but there's pressure from their families, from the society, you need to go get an education. So a lot of people, uh, when they are 18 or 17, they go into university with, like, I, I was that person for sure. I had no idea what I want to learn, uh, whether I want to learn, what I want to do with my life. I was completely clueless on all of that. And I went into an engineering school because I was the closest one to home and it was considered good. I had nothing to do with me. I didn't learn anything in that university because I didn't want to. And I think there's a ton of people like that in Russia. And so the percentage of educated people, is like people with higher education, is very high. But in many cases, that edu- education isn't worth anything because, you know, I, went, I wasn't trying to learn, so I didn't learn anything. I do have this diploma that says uh, that I'm, uh, I can make integrated circuits, but I can't. I've never done that in my life. You know, and, and my diploma was fake. Like, I, if I was offended, sort of, uh, at the situation, because if the thing that I claimed to have invented in my diploma actually existed, that would be like a breakthrough little thing. Like, the, I, I should have gotten a lot of respect for it. Uh, I only got a B, but it was all fake. That thing that I claimed to have invented, it didn't exist. We made up the numbers and we just, and that's what a lot of people do. And so it's like, it's a different kind of situation with higher education. But in any case, I mean, the American thing really, uh, really has been, and I think, yeah, is still confusing to me with the lawns. Uh, I, I dated a, an American girl uh, at one point and she decided to get like she had the bachelor's from years ago and she decided to um uh continue the education and took out a loan for that and i couldn't wrap my mind around the decision because it seemed so weird like you you don't have steady income 
you're not like how are you going to pay this uh debt back why is it so important i didn't i couldn't understand the connection like this promise well this is going to be this high education that i have so that will get me a job that to me didn't make sense why would it, how how can you be certain of that and uh and so through that through a personal kind of relationship i tried to figure out this broader issue because i knew her case was not like the reason she was acting that way is because the culture was acting that way a lot of people of her age were doing the same thing and thought it would made sense uh, and i couldn't figure out how exactly that makes sense so w when you find yourself as uh you know that friend of mine let's say you're 30 something and you have this huge loan that you uh have to pay back there is no way to really do that so it kind of becomes additional tax on your salary that you're going to be paying for the rest of your life that whole system is fucking weird it is and there's I've heard people say it's it's the American way. And I it kind of in a certain sense that's actually true. Like we started our country like by the seat of our pants on loans from France. Like it's kind of mm. a trip. Mm -hmm. But um I would say, you know, it's an interesting situation because I see it differently than a lot of people see it because I actually value my education. Like I don't have the, I did not have the same experience as you. Right. I knew I wanted a liberal arts education, but I didn't know what that was. Mm -hmm. Coming from a blue collar town, my dad's an auto guy, my mom's a paralegal. I didn't know what a liberal arts education was, but I knew I wanted it. I knew I wanted to go to the place where you read the books. You know what I mean? So you wanted and, something different from what was like immediately offered. Yeah, and it wasn't even that I wanted a different life job wise or anything though. I mean, I did probably want to leave my hometown, but I knew I wanted to study, you know, I wanted to mm -hmm. study the things that were in that library. And I, it, and so now, you know, I have a master's in English now and I very much value my education and you're right. Like my student loans are an additional tax on my income. Um, a lot of people justify it because of statistical averages. You're statistically more likely to have a better income and that actually plays out most of the time it plays out but that right. doesn't mean it's that doesn't mean it's easy and it doesn't mean that you spend your time doing what you want to do a lot of people spin their wheels in jobs that they don't like you know yeah uh, i mean for me it's just the idea of of a loan is so fucking scary like people of of my generation have taken them out like it's i think mostly women are like more practically minded and get um you know, I know, uh, I know these uh, young women who have apartments in Moscow or St. Petersburg because they took out a loan, they worked for it, they, they had this plan. It's very expensive. To me, that was never really an option. I never thought about it because uh, I was so, like, it, it changed you, right? I can't quit my job if I have to pay uh, this loan out every month. Yeah, you have to be more cavalier about it. You have to be more like, let them come after me. You know, like if I, if I, and that's, I think that's. I've really met some thing. Americans who just, who left America and went to Russia because they had, yeah. or that was part of reason of the reasoning because they had these people who wanted money from them. And they said, you know what? Fuck off. I'm in a different country. What are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> we that's an option. A, dude, we have such a, it's so weird. Like part of the reason I'm so frustrated by the Democrats is that they think that we have these like legitimate institutions and we don't, mm -hmm. our country is such a loose assemblage of radical perspectives that like that, that's a big tangent that I just went on, but I really think that there's something to it. Like, I don't think that our institutions have as much merit as some people seem to want to think they're, they're not as grounding they're not as sustaining we're we're a really loosely grouped assemblage of wild people you know i don't know a disparate that, 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 that is really interesting i i've been going through this like in my understanding of america throughout the last i don't know a dozen of years i've uh like at the at the early stages when I was just learning what America is, even when I went to America and spent some time there, uh, though at that point 
less than in the beginning. I totally bought this idea of a working system and here's how it works and here's the checks and balances and the free press and this and that. And it all, because, you know, I was learning, I really like the first introduction into the American kind of what America is politically and socially to me was the daily show. And this was not like I was watching it because I had no, I didn't know who the Democrats are, who the Republicans are. I remember like watching this with my friends because it was interesting and funny and like yeah, different and a guy and a good set with a suit you know he seems like he's got it together you know well it was so for us it was uh this like exotic weird kind of thing like it was good comedy for me when i was uh 17 and i was learning about what america was from it and it was this it, it was just this kind of like almost like people pick up a, a foreign language or something that that becomes your hobby you're just curious about what this is. I had no stake in the game. I didn't care about the one side or the other. And it was just interesting to learn that, okay, so the way it works there is they have these two sides. For some reason, it's like abortion and taxes are the big things. That's how they, like, that was all just funny and weird to, to learn. But I did buy uh, the this, like, civic idealist view of America and... And and also, uh, you know, on contrast with Russia, like it was everybody in Russia knows the system is all kinds of fucked up and th there's none of this like idealism towards the system that we live in. And so the idea that there's a place where things do make sense and work is uh, you kind of just agree with it because you, you don't know how the world is. You know your place is fucked up and they say that there are these places where things work. And, you know, if you do visit or you watch a TV show or whatever, it does seem like you guys have, uh, you live better, you know? Your, your country didn't fall apart. <laughs> not, not, not most of your countries like below the poverty line, etc. And so... Uh, I bought in this this ideal, and then as I learn more and more, and I have more experience with America, I'm uh, starting to question. I, I definitely the system as it is now doesn't seem to make any sense to me. Uh, doesn't doesn't seem like it's this working thing. Like it may survive or it may not. It depends on chance and people involved. And uh, it, but I don't you. have any like trust in this. This is gonna work because it's very uh, thought out. Let me tell you something. And I, cause I, I hear so many people on the quote unquote left, like knocking capitalism or whatever. Let me, but let me tell you something. My town last week got hit by a sort of Midwestern hurricane, hundred mile an hour winds, okay. blew a stoplight over, tore the stoplight out of the concrete, knocked it over. Hundred mile hour winds. Part of the city of Cedar Rapids was out of power for a week. I was out of power. For half a day, I was out of internet for a day and a half. Now I've got internet working because it's that, that market, the company's got to get that internet up because it's paying customers are complaining, you know, mm -hmm. and it gets it up. <laughs> and that's what America is. It's like um, a bunch of mercantile people providing goods and services to people at the cheapest price possible. That's what it is. And you get all of this punditocracy making this big media storm about all of these like supposedly ideological differences but that's not that's not it man people are just like just the basic stuff that people have they have families they want to eat they're afraid for the future they right you know, all of the basic human survival shit bob is really amazing robert wright is really amazing at, at getting at this materialist stuff he's got a very interesting type of evolutionary minded uh marxism very very soft like it's not a soft but it's a quiet marxism it's, it's interesting you mentioned marxism yeah. i always felt that there is a a quality to his thinking like it, in it it looks at this like material level like uh, everything is i guess they would call no that's not the right term i was about to say superstructure but that's not the, the correct well uh of describing him but but he is skeptical about the explanations for th that we get for how things, uh, how yeah. and why things happen because they are ideological. It's a narrative that we create. 
and he likes to look at the economic kind of reality at the foundational level or psychological reality too yeah yeah you know i mean there's this idea in the united states that it's like these pious people <laughs> arrived in this new world and finally there was a nation like a true israel you know like a and you see it in the names of some of these pennsylvania towns like bethlehem and shit like that uh -huh, like uh -huh. um salem massachusetts you know like jerusalem you know the, these these um there's this mythology and this guy this president reagan really crystallized it into this he he also took the actor popular culture thing and it made this mm -hmm. you know you talk about you know how you almost blow your top when you hear fellow russians talking about the metaphysical russia if but there is a metaphysical america where yeah. people think that the constitution finally finally there was a document that humans were able to make and you hear you hear it like a, a a jewish guy ben shapiro saying this you know it's like this divinely right. inspired document that is truly sacred egalitarian, thing. Yeah. truly egalitarian and you know that's no <laughs> there were a lot of you know and that's one thing about the 1619 project that actually whereas they may be inaccurate in the way that they represent the the role of slavery in the in the founding of the country they're very good about recognizing what you described that there are material forces that it's not mm -hmm. just you know the the ideological mythology like i understand why we need the mythology we need mythologies or we seem we seem to need mythologies i don't know whether we actually need them or not but it's I interesting. Do you think you, you, that we need mythologies? I do. I mean, I, I, I want a mythology. I'm, I'm developing my own mythology. I know, you know, consciously I'm trying to, to have a world uh, of symbols and myths and stories to interact with. It makes more sense to me than, um, or, or not that it makes more sense to me, but it appeals to me more. It's more of a my thing, I think, just my way of thinking i like mythological symbolic uh, uh, way of looking at things then let's say what uh you know bob's uh, more straightforward rational materialistic kind of view and i think that's just personal preference i think it just people are better at different kinds of languages at different ways of looking at things and uh you know, I'm more of this kind of person. He's more of a that kind of person. We need different languages. It's very important, I think, to try to learn different kinds of languages like that so that you can understand what the other person means. Um, and, um, and we do have, like, I'm trying to create my own mythology. It's a very slow process of just putting my own world together out of the bits and pieces that I like or that appeal to me or that I um, can come up with myself. Um, but people will, like groups of people will develop their own mythologies, whether you want them or not, whether you think it's good or bad, that's going to be a part of how things are. And we see now this whole slew of sort of, uh, some of them new, some of them are revamped old ideas that are popping up, like the flat earth, the different ver conspiracy theories, uh, uh, all the way to the lizard people and uh, to ancient aliens and, and, and all of that. And I think those are mythologies that, you know, if you, if you, if you have a vacuum, something is going to fill it. If you don't have uh, good mythologies, you can, not necessarily bad ones will, will appear. I'm not even knocking the, the flat earth. I'm just saying that you're not going to not have something like that. You're not going to have a vacuum. I think that's really what Trump is, is, and it drives a lot of people crazy because they haven't offered an alternative. Right. He is like, I'm an American entrepreneur. I look at market forces and I make realistic deals. You know, I push through and I make an argument for the case as I see it and get the deal that I think we deserve. There are a lot of people that are very grateful to hear somebody talk like that. And, you know, the other side just doesn't have anybody like that, you know. They want to tie all of these 
disparate identity groups together mm-hmm. and have it come through on the they want justice justice to be the the thing that but okay so you need to have somebody who's making deals in terms of justice and it may be that uh, Kamala Harris was a brilliant pick for that respect a lot of people hate her because she was such um such a vicious um uh attorney uh what what's the prosecutor such a mm-hmm. vicious prosecutor against people and we're very we've changed our mindset about marijuana in the last decade right our country used to be very anti marijuana and now it's very pro marijuana um and she was a vicious prosecutor and did a lot of things to the black community that people think were not good but on the other hand she's a prose- a vicious prosecutor who can give voice to this idea of justice and we'll see i don't know i i don't have any faith that that duo can combat trump at this point when i look at the ads and when i so you're but I sure might be trump is going to win i'm if i were going to bet 100 dollars right now i'd bet on trump interesting i was i it, about a month or two ago i think i was kind of walking around thinking i should find myself an american to bet to have a a monetary bet on about the election i would vote, you know put my bet on trump as well but I'm not so sure anymore. And I don't know if it, you know what, for me, I think it's just at some point, I, uh, I, I did give in to the kind of looking at 2020 as this weird fucking year that I don't, I, I'm going to stop trying to predict the future. Not that I was big on that anyway, but with COVID, and then the American, the, the, would re, the way different countries reacted, the way America reacted to COVID, the protests that are started happening in America. I know the election is coming up soon. Meanwhile, here, Belarus is, I don't know what's going to happen there. Like it looked uh, for, for a few days, it looked to me that uh, Lukashenko has no chance really of staying in power. Now it's sort of starting to look at, to, to me that he may stay for a long time, but in a, uh, well, I don't know. So anyway, all that shit's happening. We just recently, Navalny got poisoned, it seemed, and he was just, uh, you know, Putin's main opponent uh, is in a coma right now in Germany. And he was in a coma for, for a couple of days in Siberia, and they were trying to get him out uh, to a hospital that they can trust, uh, because to be in a in Russia, in a state hospital, when your suspicion is the state is the one who poisoned you, trying to kill you, you know that's not the, the that didn't seem to them very um, uh, promising. So they finally got him out, and he's in Germany now. And we don't know if he's going to live or not. We don't know if uh, you know what's going to happen there. And so to me, at some point, this like threshold of pieces that I could look at and try to make a prediction of how it's going to go. Uh, it's, it has become too much, and I'm uh, I'm just watching. I think now, uh, what, I'm not feeling. I, I don't feel that I can participate in any way in these big things anymore because they're happening too quickly. I can't make my mind about them, and they, the situation changes before I, I come up with like uh, my approach to it. And so these big social political realities, now I'm just kind of watching them, uh, not knowing how it's going to turn out. Yeah, man, I don't know. I mean, it's like, I'm prepared for surprise, but I also just like feel in my gut that Trump is going to win. I've just felt like that for a And what happens if he wins? The thing uh, just continues, or is it uh, a, a, take, a huge disruptive thing that Democrats uh, take the Senate and there's a balance of power, and the, and the Congress is just gridlocked for four more years. That's no big deal. It was gridlocked during the Obama administration too. Okay, that's how our system works. It gridlocks. <laughs> it's designed Oops. for it. It's designed to gridlock. It's designed to gridlock, so you can't have too sweeping of a legislation. Mm, right, makes given sense. Yeah. Presidency. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I don't know how. To me, it's just become coming back to the mythologies. I guess part of the reason I'm trying to look for mythologies and to come up with my own kind of way of looking at things is because the 
conventional way just isn't really working for me. Like I can't use it. I can't uh, follow the story. Like let's say if we're looking at America, uh, I can't get into the competition between the Democrats and the Republicans and uh, and and accept the narrative that's. Uh, like the default kind of mainstream, like the John Stewart narrative, like the thing that I learned when I was learning about what America is from John Stewart and people like that, I can't use their language anymore because it's not it, 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 it's not giving me a convincing story that I can follow or interact with. Uh, I, I now, if I was to try to understand what's going to happen in America or the world with these big dynamics, you know, the pandemic or the overthrowing of the um, governments in different parts or the, the clashes uh, that are happening in America, for me to try to make sense uh, of all of that, I need a new language. I need to be thinking about Pepe the Frog. I need to be thinking about Keg the God of Chaos. I need to be thinking about UFO uh, theories or something, some kind of absurdist uh, symbolic uh, narrative about all of this. I need to be thinking about, I don't know, people as expressions of ideas, uh, you know, watching Trump as, like one, one example is Gary Lackman said um, in a conversation I had with him that he kind of viewed Trump as the TV reality that represented world in television popping into your, our usual reality because we put so much reality into television because you know the, the reality shows and the reality shows about people watching reality shows so much of this human attention and 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 the realistic approach to things was put into the tv box that something was going to pop out and that is one way of looking at trump like that kind of way I'm not saying like I, I agree or disagree even with that idea but that way of speaking about the situation this gives me hope that I can use it to say something meaningful or to learn something meaningful or maybe predict what's going to happen or, you know, engage with it in some meaningful way. While I go, I, every once in a while, I do go to the homepage of the New York Times and I don't know why I'm doing that. I, think, I mean, I, I do have read like the most recently when shit was going down in Belarus, it's still going down, but it was this big, thing totally unprecedented in in the last 30 years nothing like that happened and then the previous 70 years was the soviet union so it was a completely new huge situation that we all paid attention to and i was curious what this like i do have this vision from somewhere from pr or something of the new york times as this like very like this is how journalism is supposed to be. Like they're upholding this journalism, and I go there, and it's totally—it's never been that. Uh, you know, any time that I've watched, maybe it was that fifty years ago. I don't really know, but it's definitely—I don't get that now. But now that I—I I go, I went to the New York Times homepage to see what Americans are saying about what how the American media is looking at the Belarus situation, and I had scroll, to scroll like twelve screens to see a mention of it, and I had to scroll through. Some headline was uh, something like these Native American women are reshaping the face of science fiction or something like that. And it's interesting to me, I would, you know, if, if, if I was like in the arts and entertainment section of a popular magazine and there's like, hey, there's interesting shit happening in science fiction, there are these several women, uh, Native American women who are changing, that, that would make sense. But how that takes precedent before the possible overthrow of a government in Belarus, um, you know, to me was, was weird. But why am I saying all of that? I'm looking at this homepage of the New York Times and I can't use any of it. I can't uh, like read an article to get an understanding of the situation that I actually am going to use in my own thinking down the road. So for that, I need to go to these weirder places with stories and, uh, you know, absurdist or psychedelic ideas or something of that kind. Two things. One, yeah, that's interesting about the New York Times. I canceled my subscription the day mm -hmm. after Trump was elected because I was like, you're not fucking reporting anything. 
Right. And I started noticing after Trump was elected that every single headline was an editorial Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The news are a horrible person. We don't really like He's doing this. Like you can't, you can't put that in a fucking headline. Destroying democracy and and everything boogie. From the intersection of 218 and 80, rivers like our own secrecies they never find. United States, we had this movement. I'm Aaron McNabb. Maybe in the seventies where there's this movement to, to make, um, secondary education or college education like more commonplace for the United mm-hmm. States. So, so state universities became a thing and um, student loan financing became a thing so that more and more people went to college, uh, but, but also oftentimes were accruing a lot of student debt. And then as right. a result of that bubble, tuitions went way up. Mm-hmm. And um, so there are a lot of United States citizens who are benefited greatly from that because they're, you know, literate and, you know, at least semi-educated. Uh, but also in many cases, uh, United States citizens are very um, resentful towards academia as a result of that because there was a sort of false promise of job security or job promise and, and right. you know, all of this stuff. So people are a lot of people are really skeptical of academia as a result of that. I don't know if you have any analogs for that in Russia, any skepticism towards academic learning or anything like that? Uh, there's skepticism of a different kind, but the system is completely different. And, uh, uh, you know, the frustrations are very different. It's sort of the opposite because uh, higher education is public, free. Um, I mean, you can... So there's like... A, you, you do need to pass... You pass a test when you finish school, sort of like GD, whatever acronym you have, GDE. Yeah, GED, general GED, ed- ed- yeah. ed- education diploma or something like that. So we, you get that, you get a score after you uh, finish high school, and then that score allows you to, if it's high enough, allows you to enter a really good university, if it's a little lower than a shittier one, and uh, so forth. And so if you study... Uh, you can get somewhere. You could get in to some university, maybe not the best one, but uh, into some uh, university for free. And moreover, for men, um, this is something you really want to do because if you don't, then you may be drafted into the army because the service is mandatory. And so that, uh, with, with, with girls, you know, there's not that, kind of direct threat that you try to avoid by going to the school, but there's pressure from their families, from the society. You need to go get an education. So a lot of people, uh, when they are 18 or 17, they go into university with, like, I, I was that person for sure. I had no idea what I want to learn, uh, whether I want to learn, what I want to do with my life. I was completely clueless on all of that, and I went into an engineering school because I was the closest one to home and it was considered good. I had nothing to do with me. I didn't learn anything in that university because I didn't want to. And I think there's a ton of people like that in Russia. And so the percentage of educated people, is like people with higher education, is very high. But in many cases, that edu- education isn't worth anything because, you know, I, went, I wasn't trying to learn, so I didn't learn anything. I do have this diploma that says uh, that I'm, uh, I can make integrated circuits, but I can't. I've never done that in my life, you know, and, and my diploma was fake. Like, I, if, I was offended, sort of, uh, at the situation because if the thing that I claimed to have invented in my diploma actually existed, that would be like a breakthrough little thing. Like, the, I should have gotten a lot of respect for it. Uh, I only got a B, but it was all fake. That thing that I claimed to have invented, it didn't exist. We made up the numbers and we just, and that's what a lot of people do. And so it's like, it's a different kind of situation with higher education. But in any case, I mean, the American thing really, uh, really has been and i think yeah it's still confusing to me with the lawns uh i I dated an american girl uh at one point and she 
decided to get like she had the bachelor's from years ago and she decided to um uh continue the education and took out a loan for that and i couldn't wrap my mind around the decision because it seemed so weird like you you don't have steady income you're not like how are you going to pay this uh debt back why is it so important i didn't i couldn't understand the connection like this promise well this is going to be this high education that i have so that will get me a job that to me didn't make sense why would it, how how can you be certain of that and uh and so through that through a personal kind of relationship i tried to figure out this broader issue because i knew her case was not like the reason she was acting that way is because the culture was acting that way a lot of people of her age were doing the same thing and thought it would made sense uh, and i couldn't figure out how exactly that makes sense so w when you find yourself as uh you know that friend of mine let's say you're 30 something and you have this huge loan that you uh have to pay back there is no way to really do that so it kind of becomes additional tax on your salary that you're going to be paying for the rest of your life that whole system is fucking weird it is and there's I've heard people say it's it's the American way. And I it kind of in a certain sense that's actually true. Like we started our country like by the seat of our pants on loans from France. Like it's kind of mm. a trip. Mm -hmm. But um I would say, you know, it's an interesting situation because I see it differently than a lot of people see it because I actually value my education. Like I don't have the, I did not have the same experience as you. Right. I knew I wanted a liberal arts education, but I didn't know what that was. Mm -hmm. Coming from a blue collar town, my dad's an auto guy, my mom's a paralegal. I didn't know what a liberal arts education was, but I knew I wanted it. I knew I wanted to go to the place where you read the books. You know what I mean? So you wanted and, something different from what was like immediately offered. Yeah, and it wasn't even that I wanted a different life job wise or anything though. I mean, I did probably want to leave my hometown, but I knew I wanted to study, you know, I wanted to mm -hmm. study the things that were in that library. And I, it, and so now, you know, I have a master's in English now and I very much value my education and you're right. Like my student loans are an additional tax on my income. Um, a lot of people justify it because of statistical averages. You're statistically more likely to have a better income and that actually plays out most of the time it plays out but that right. doesn't mean it's that doesn't mean it's easy and it doesn't mean that you spend your time doing what you want to do a lot of people spin their wheels in jobs that they don't like you know yeah uh, i mean for me it's just the idea of of a loan is so fucking scary like people of of my generation have taken them out like it's i think mostly women are like more practically minded and get um you know, I know, uh, I know these uh, young women who have apartments in Moscow or St. Petersburg because they took out a loan, they worked for it, they, they had this plan. It's very expensive. To me, that was never really an option. I never thought about it because uh, I was so, like, it, it changed you, right? I can't quit my job if I have to pay uh, this loan out every month. Yeah, you have to be more cavalier about it. You have to be more like, let them come after me. You know, like if I, if I, and that's, I think that's. I've really met some thing. Americans who just, who left America and went to Russia because they had, yeah. or that was part of reason of the reasoning because they had these people who wanted money from them. And they said, you know what? Fuck off. I'm in a different country. What are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> we that's an option. A, dude, we have such a, it's so weird. Like part of the reason I'm so frustrated by the Democrats is that they think that we have these like legitimate institutions and we don't, mm -hmm. our country is such a loose assemblage of radical perspectives that like that, that's a big tangent that I just went on, but I really think that there's something to it. Like, I don't think that our institutions have as much merit as some people seem to want to think they're, they're not as grounding they're not as sustaining we're we're a really loosely grouped assemblage of 
wild people, you know, I don't know, a disparate. That, 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 that is really interesting. I, I've been going through this, like in my understanding of America throughout the last, I don't know, a dozen of years, I've uh, like at the, at the early stages when I was just learning what America is, even when I went to America and spent some time there, uh, though at that point less than in the beginning, I totally bought this idea of a working system and here's how it works and here's the checks and balances and the free press and this and that. And it all, because, you know, I was learning, I really like the first introduction into the American kind of what America is politically and socially to me was the daily show. And this was not like I was watching it because I had no, I didn't know who the Democrats are, who the Republicans are. I remember like watching this with my friends because it was interesting and funny and like yeah, different and a guy and a good set with a suit you know he seems like he's got it together you know well it was so for us it was uh this like exotic weird kind of thing like it was good comedy for me when i was uh 17 and i was learning about what america was from it and it was this it, it was just this kind of like almost like people pick up a, a foreign language or something that that becomes your hobby you're just curious about what this is. I had no stake in the game. I didn't care about the one side or the other. And it was just interesting to learn that, okay, so the way it works there is they have these two sides. For some reason, it's like abortion and taxes are the big things. That's how they, like, that was all just funny and weird to, to learn. But I did buy uh, the this, like, civic idealist view of America and... And and also, uh, you know, on contrast with Russia, like it was everybody in Russia knows the system is all kinds of fucked up and th there's none of this like idealism towards the system that we live in. And so the idea that there's a place where things do make sense and work is uh, you kind of just agree with it because you, you don't know how the world is. You know your place is fucked up and they say that there are these places where things work. And, you know, if you do visit or you watch a TV show or whatever, it does seem like you guys have, uh, you live better, you know? Your, your country didn't fall apart. <laughs> not, not, not most of your countries like below the poverty line, etc. And so... Uh, I bought in this this ideal, and then as I learn more and more, and I have more experience with America, I'm uh, starting to question. I, I definitely the system as it is now doesn't seem to make any sense to me. Uh, doesn't doesn't seem like it's this working thing. Like it may survive or it may not. It depends on chance and people involved. And uh, it, but I don't you. have any like trust in this. This is gonna work because it's very uh, thought out. Let me tell you something. And I, cause I, I hear so many people on the quote unquote left, like knocking capitalism or whatever. Let me, but let me tell you something. My town last week got hit by a sort of Midwestern hurricane, hundred mile an hour winds, okay. blew a stoplight over, tore the stoplight out of the concrete, knocked it over. Hundred mile hour winds. Part of the city of Cedar Rapids was out of power for a week. I was out of power. For half a day, I was out of internet for a day and a half. Now I've got internet working because it's that, that market, the company's got to get that internet up because it's paying customers are complaining, you know, mm -hmm. and it gets it up. <laughs> and that's what America is. It's like um, a bunch of mercantile people providing goods and services to people at the cheapest price possible. That's what it is. And you get all of this punditocracy making this big media storm about all of these like supposedly ideological differences but that's not that's not it man people are just like just the basic stuff that people have they have families they want to eat they're afraid for the future they right you know, all of the basic human survival shit bob is really amazing robert wright is really amazing at, at getting at this materialist stuff he's got a very interesting type of evolutionary minded uh marxism very very soft like it's not a soft but it's a quiet marxism it's, it's interesting you mentioned marxism yeah. i've always felt that there is a a quality to his thinking like it, in it 
it looks at this like material level, like uh, everything is, I guess they would call, no, that's not the right term. I was about to say superstructure, but that's not the, the correct way uh, of describing it. But, but he is skeptical about the explanations for, th that we get for how things, uh, how yeah. and why things happen because they are ideological. It's a narrative that we create and he likes to look at the economic kind of reality at the foundational level or psychological reality too, yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's this idea in the United States that it's like these pious people <laughs> arrived in this new world and finally there was a nation, like a true Israel, you know, like a, and you see it in the names of some of these Pennsylvania towns like Bethlehem and shit like that. Uh -huh, like uh -huh. um, Salem, Massachusetts, you know, like Jerusalem, you know, the, these, these, um, there's this mythology and this guy, this president Reagan really crystallized it into this. He, he also took the actor popular culture thing and it made this, mm -hmm. you know, you talk about, you know, how you, almost blow your top when you hear fellow Russians talking about the metaphysical Russia. If, but there is a metaphysical America where yeah. people think that the constitution finally, finally there was a document that humans were able to make. And you hear, you hear it like a, a, a Jewish guy, Ben Shapiro saying this, you know, it's like this divinely right. inspired document that is truly egalitarian, yeah. truly egalitarian. And, you know, that's no, <laughs> there were a lot of, you know, and that's one thing about the 1619 project that actually, whereas they may be inaccurate in the way that they represent the, the role of slavery in the, in the founding of the country, they're very good about recognizing what you described, that there are material forces, that it's not mm -hmm. just, you know, the, the ideological mythology. Like, I understand why we need the mythology. We need mythologies or we seem... We seem to need mythologies. I don't know whether we actually need them or not, but it's I interesting. Do you, you think you, that we need mythologies? I do. I mean, I, I I want a mythology. I'm I'm developing my own mythology. I know, you know, consciously, I'm trying to to have a world uh, of symbols and myths and stories to interact with. It makes more sense to me than. Um, or, or not that it makes more sense to me, but it appeals to me more. It's more of a my thing, I think, my, just my way of thinking. I like mythological, symbolic uh, uh, way of looking at things. Then, let's say what, uh, you know, Bob's uh, more straightforward, rational, materialistic kind of view. And I think that's just personal preference. I think it just people are better at different kinds of languages at different ways of looking at things. And, uh, you know, I'm more of this kind of person. He's more of a, that kind of person. We need different languages. It's very important, I think, to try to learn different kinds of languages like that so that you can understand what the other person means. Um, and, um, and we do have, like, I'm trying to create my own mythology. It's a very slow process of just putting my own world together out of the bits and pieces that I like or that appeal to me or that I um, can come up with myself. Um, but people will, like groups of people will develop their own mythologies, whether you want them or not, whether you think it's good or bad, that's going to be a part of how things are. And we see now this whole slew of sort of, uh, some of them new, some of them are revamped, old ideas that are popping up, like the flat earth, the different ver conspiracy theories, uh, uh, all the way to the lizard people and uh, to ancient aliens and, and, and all of that. And I think those are mythologies that, you know, if you, if you, if you have a vacuum, something is going to fill it. If you don't have uh, good mythologies, you can, not necessarily bad ones will, will appear. I'm not even knocking the, the flat earth. I'm just saying that you're not going to not have something like that. You're not going to have a vacuum. I think that's really what Trump is, is, and it drives a lot of people crazy because they haven't offered an alternative. Right. He is like, I'm an American entrepreneur. 
I look at market forces and I make realistic deals. You know, I push through and I make an argument for the case as I see it and get the deal that I think we deserve. There are a lot of people that are very grateful to hear somebody talk like that. And, you know, the other side just doesn't have anybody like that. You know, they want to tie all of these disparate identity groups together Mm -hmm. and have it come through on the, they want justice, justice to be the, the thing that, but okay. So you need to have somebody who's making deals in terms of justice. And it may be that uh, Kamala Harris was a brilliant pick for that respect. A lot of people hate her because she was such, um, such a vicious um, uh, attorney. Uh, what, what's the prosecutor? Such a mm-hmm. vicious prosecutor against people. And we're very, we've changed our mindset about marijuana in the last decade. Right. Our country used to be very anti-marijuana, and now it's very pro-marijuana. Um, and she was a vicious prosecutor and did a lot of things to the black community that people think were not good. But on the other hand, she's a, prose- a vicious prosecutor who can give voice to this idea of justice. And we'll see. I don't know. I, I don't have any faith that that duo can combat Trump at this point when I look at the ads and when I, so you're but I sure might be Trump is going to win. I'm, if I were going to bet a hundred dollars right now, I bet on Trump. Interesting. I was, I, it, about a month or two ago, I think I was kind of walking around thinking I should find myself an American to bet, to have a, a monetary bet on about the election. I would vote, you know, put my bet on Trump as well, but I'm not so sure anymore. And I don't know if it, you know what, for me, I think it's just at some point, I, uh, I, I did give in to the kind of looking at 2020 as this weird fucking year that I don't, I, I'm going to stop trying to predict the future. Not that I was big on that anyway, but with COVID and then the American, the, the, the way different countries reacted, the way America reacted to COVID, the protests that are started happening in America. I know the election is coming up soon. Meanwhile, here, Belarus is, I don't know what's going to happen there. Like it looked uh, for, for a few days, it looked to me that uh, Lukashenko has no chance really of staying in power. Now it's sort of starting to look at, to, to me that he may stay for a long time, but in a, uh, well, I don't know. So anyway, all that shit is happening. We just recently, Navalny got poisoned, it seemed, and he was just, uh, you know, Putin's main opponent uh, is in a coma right now in Germany, and he was in a coma for, for a couple of days in Siberia, and they were trying to get him out uh, to a hospital that they can trust, uh, because to be in, a, in Russia in a state hospital when your suspicion is the state is the one who poisoned you, trying to kill you, you know, that's not the... the that didn't seem to them very um, uh, promising. So they finally got him out, and he's in Germany now, and we don't know if he's going to live or not. We don't know if, uh, you know what's going to happen there. And so to me, at some point, this like threshold of pieces that I could look at and try to make a prediction of how it's going to go, uh, it's be- it has become too much. And I'm, uh, I'm just watching, I think, now. Uh, what- I'm not feeling... I don't feel that I can participate in any way in these big things anymore because they're happening too quickly. I can't make my mind about them and they, the situation changes before I, I come up with like uh, my approach to it. And so these big social political realities, now I'm just kind of watching them, uh, not knowing how it's going to turn out. Yeah, man. I don't know. I mean, it's like I'm prepared for surprise, but I also just like feel in my gut that Trump is going to win. I've just felt like that for. And what happens if he wins? The thing Uh, just continues, or is it uh, a a, a huge disruptive thing that Democrats uh, take the Senate and? there's a balance of power and the, and the Congress is just gridlocked for four more years. That's no big deal. It was gridlocked during the Obama administration too. Okay. That's how our system works. It gridlocks. 
It's designed for it. It's designed to gridlock. It's designed to gridlock, so you can't have too sweeping of a legislation. Mm, right, makes given sense. Yeah. Presidency. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I don't know how. To me, it's just become coming back to the mythologies. I guess part of the reason I'm trying to look for mythologies and to come up with my own kind of way of looking at things is because the conventional way just isn't really working for me like i can't use it i can't uh follow the story like let's say if we're looking at america uh i can't get into the competition between the democrats and the republicans and uh and and accept the narrative that's uh like the default kind of mainstream like the john stewart narrative like the thing that i learned when I was learning about what America is from Jon Stewart and people like that, I can't use their language anymore because it's not, it, 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 it's not giving me a convincing story that I can follow or interact with. Uh, I, I, now, if I was to try to understand what's going to happen in America or the world with these big dynamics, you know, the pandemic or the overthrowing of the... Um, governments in different parts or the the clashes uh, that are happening in america for me to try to make sense uh of all of that i need a new language i need to be thinking about pepe the frog i need to be thinking about keg the god of chaos i need to be thinking about ufo uh theories or something some kind of absurdist uh, symbolic uh, narrative about all of this. I need to be thinking about, I don't know, people as expressions of ideas, uh, you know, watching Trump as, like one, one example is Gary Lackman said um, in a conversation I had with him that he kind of viewed Trump as the TV reality that represented world in television popping into your our usual reality because we put so much reality into television because you know the, the reality shows and the reality shows about people watching reality shows so much of this human attention and 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 the realistic approach to things was put into the tv box that something was going to pop out and that is one way of looking at trump like that kind of way I'm not saying like I, I agree or disagree even with that idea but that way of speaking about the situation this gives me hope that I can use it to say something meaningful or to learn something meaningful or maybe predict what's going to happen or, you know, engage with it in some meaningful way. While I go, I, every once in a while, I do go to the homepage of the New York Times and I don't know why I'm doing that. I, think, I mean, I, I do have read like the most recently when shit was going down in Belarus, it's still going down, but it was this big thing totally unprecedented in in the last 30 years nothing like that happened and then the previous 70 years was the soviet union so it was a completely new huge situation that we all paid attention to and i was curious what this like i do have this vision from somewhere from pr or something of the new york times as this like very like this is how journalism is supposed to be. Like they're upholding this journalism, and I go there, and it's totally—it's never been that. Uh, you know, any time that I've watched, maybe it was that 50 years ago. I don't really know, but it's definitely—I don't get that now. But now that I—I I go, I went to the New York Times homepage to see what Americans are saying about what how the American media is looking at the Belarus situation, and I had scroll, to scroll like 12 screens to see a mention of it, and I had to scroll through. Some headline was uh, something like these Native American women are reshaping the face of science fiction or something like that. And it's interesting to me, I would, you know, if, if, if I was like in the arts and entertainment section of a popular magazine and there's like, hey, there's interesting shit happening in science fiction, there are these several women uh native american women who are changing that that would make sense but how that takes precedent before the possible overthrow of a government in belarus um you know to me was was weird but why am i saying all of that i'm looking at this homepage of the new york times and i can't use any of it i can't uh like read an article to get 
an understanding of the situation that I actually am going to use in my own thinking down the road. So for that, I need to go to these weirder places with stories and, uh, you know, absurdist or psychedelic ideas or something of that kind. Two things. One, yeah, that's interesting about the New York Times. I canceled my subscription the day mm -hmm. after Trump was elected because I was like, you're not fucking reporting anything. Right. And I started noticing after Trump was elected that every single headline was an editorial Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The news are a horrible person. We don't really like He's doing this. Like you can't, you can't put that in a fucking headline. Destroying democracy and, and yeah. yada, everything boogeyman, boogeyman. And then, um, but the thing about that is, remember what I said, America is mercantile, man. Right. They've got bigger subscribership than they've had in a long time. They've mm. got, they're getting more people to subscribe digitally Mm -hmm. than ever before and they were really hurting 15 years ago the new york times almost folded at one point mm -hmm. so the old model wasn't working this model is working that's interesting so they're gonna keep doing it uh and you just and i'm just i'm not gonna give them money i still do look at their headlines i look at their front page just about every day but anyway so that's first point second point have you thought about materialism as far as mythology goes i've actually been turning more towards material. I thought it was interesting what you said, different languages, you know, there's these different, I've noticed that scientists, quote unquote, have just such a different way of talking about and looking at reality because they're so used to reducing things to experimental right. conditions that they just, you know, to talk to a scientist about why their attitude towards religion isn't isn't getting the picture they it's they don't understand because they're just like obviously religion is bullshit but that's not oh well, not every scientist is like not that every scientist but many many seem to be in that vein and and it and that's changed i mean it actually i mean i do you're right nikita i need to be i see too many of the scientists who are making side careers as media people right there is um, there's a difference between us i think a most scientist pr many and a practicing scientists go to church you know yeah uh they're just not in the fucking media you know yeah yeah uh but but i do think that there's a, a anyway the only reason i brought up materialism is because i think it's interesting robert wright seems to be one of these materialists who's also not given up on spiritual pursuit. I think John Horgan to some extent also. And what's interesting is the material world. I mean, you saw it when Robert Wright um, interviewed um, the fellow from um, the, the philosophy professor. I'm blanking on his name, but they talked about physicalism. Uh, Gideon Rose? Oh, no, that yeah, was Gideon different. Rosen. That's exactly. Oh, right. it wasn't okay. Materialism is very weird. Like if you actually <laughs> go full materialist, reality is not any less weird. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, they, once you start to get to whether it's a, a physicist talking about quantum or whether you're talking about information being conveyed by DNA and chemistry. All of that stuff is very weird. Uh, so I think it's a perfectly functional mythology, <laughs> materialism. I think, I think it lacks, uh, it lacks, um, it, it has kind of an underdeveloped, um, I guess, language, like a, a kind of language that, that it, it still needs to develop. This is, it's been on my mind because. It, well, it depends. It, it depends on what we what we do. We we can make seems it. Seems to be headed in that direction. I think. Um, maybe I don't know. I've I've heard just a, a few interviews of, of of him, but I I don't know about his project. But but what you're saying has been on my mind recently. Uh, I have this idea that I haven't figured out uh, fully yet, but you know, you helped with a transcript of a John Horgan's interview. Uh, with what was his name? Uh, Goff, uh, panpsychism. Yeah, and I kind of started to get into panpsychism after that. After doing that, anyway, it's 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 an interesting. It's definitely an interesting thing to think about for me. I I'm not understanding again. It it 
I feel I like many of these. I think it's totally legit to say that a molecule is conscious. It reacts to things. It it's sentient. It responds to its environment. I'm fine with it. Absolutely. Like I I I have this. Like I'm not buying into any. Like I'm not gonna take any way of looking at the world. Uh, any any given way of looking at the world as and just adopt it as the way but yes. i i like entertaining different ones and this well, one goff, makes perfect sense to me goff was interesting because goff said look i just think it's the most promising view that i've been able right. to find empirically right right <laughs> but but so what, what i was uh getting at is this working with this interview is a part of a bigger kind of project that i'm trying to figure out now which is um is doing, I guess, what you, what I said is lacking. Uh, the, the, there are these scientific findings, ideas, way of looking at things, theories that are supposed to describe reality, right? It describes reality at this fundamental level. Uh, but there is no bridge between that and Trump or like quantum physics. You can, you're, studying you're trying to figure out what the world is but you can't use that uh those things that you or not, not that you can't but people don't there is not a, a developed language yet to apply what you learn about the reality what the world is to your politics you know to your relationship to your society to the practical uh dimension of life i think it has to do with um analogic or metaphorical symbolical language which is used in daily conversation and mathematics mm -hmm. uh i think that i think that in a sort of pure scientific idea the pure expression of true reality would be in mathematics mm -hmm. that's not how people talk man i think i may be wrong about this but uh i think if you look at people like newton let's say you know scientists or or uh, what would you call them like pre-scientists i don't know where where you uh make the mark but like like let's say alchemists who were developing real chemistry like they that that's the foundation of our chemistry but, but i think those people time. were also very mystical and i think part of like if you look at uh, how they describe these um experiments they were making they, I think, were trying to speak at the same time about this very concrete physical experiment in the physical retort with particular substances, and yet also speak metaphorically about the reality of the mind or the soul, right? We, and again, I may be wrong about all of this because I'm not educated enough, but this is my perception of, of that kind of project and we still have like even in our language we still have remnants of that like you can say that you can use mercurial as a description of what a quality of a person or or thought or something that comes from mercury because mercury was considered uh the, the physical element of mercury w which uh mirrors everything and and behaves in this weird way somehow to these alchemists was uh tied to the soul or the mind and so they were making these physical experiments with mercury in the background or maybe in the foreground of their mind holding that they're trying to figure something out about the human soul and how these processes in the mind are working which again if we look at panpsychism that would be a totally reasonable way to go about things if you think that physical elements are conscious then when you study how they behave in a lab you should be learning something about how consciousness behaves yeah and to add one more interesting dimension to what you describe about the alchemists so i'm glad you brought up mercury so the other interesting component of that is that they chose to call the element mercury right because it's a greco-roman god right right and so the idea of science in the alchemical era had to do with looking back towards ancient things, mm -hmm. things that weren't European, but were, well, were proto-European, but Greco-Roman right. culture. There was this whole idea in the Renaissance, and, you know, alchemy was like just as we were beginning to enter 
the Renaissance, but this idea of looking at ancient studies because it, it had all been kind of bleached out and we needed to bring the ancients back to be able to look forward. That's fascinating. <laughs> my my favorite, oh, yeah, sure. Ahead. No, go ahead, your favorite. My, my favorite uh, little like bit of information that I try to hold in my mind uh, that that is is difficult at times is this juxtaposition between the way well there are two things one I remember I, I I went to Italy and I went to Rome and I was looking at all these ancient you know the Colosseum and and all of these things and there yeah, to me happened. they were way more interesting than what is actually happening in Italy right now like the the actual city of Rome as it exists Absolutely. now yeah and. Uh, uh, the guide told us something that stuck with me. Uh, she was talking about, I guess, Michelangelo um, and said that uh, pointing at some of the ruins that are now have been uh, uncovered uh, from, you know, the dirt, the, uh, uh, the ground, the earth. Um, she said, now you see like these columns uh, in their entirety when Michelangelo was walking around the city and looking at the same things, they were more of them were under the ground. And so the idea of, of a person, so this is like, there are all of these people living in fucking Rome, like this is the city, right? And they are at the cutting edge of their civilization, these scientists and, and painters and uh, these Renaissance people. And in the center of this city, you have the remnants of a previous civilization that looked more advanced than yours, right? So it's an analogous, like if, if we started to excavate in something in the Red Square and we found a UFO type situation there, like how would you feel? Like what, what do you think about your place in, in reality and, 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 and your uh, society? And so you look at that and you try to back engineer yeah. that reality. That's Wait, this is actually actually. interesting that I've never thought about it. It, it. The UFO belief that is spreading now and getting, gaining legitimacy via, you know, publications in the New York Times and, and uh, statements by the Pentagon and stuff and the Joe Rogan podcast. You can make a parallel here because they're, they're talking about this like advanced technology, you know, a fallen UFO or something that the scientists are trying to look at and back engineer this incredible technology. It's similar like that story, that 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 uh, uh, idea, it's similar to what the Renaissance people were doing with the Greco-Roman world, right? They had remnants of the civilization that they didn't know enough about, and they created this new European reality largely based on that. And the thing that I was getting to, my favorite bit, is that they got it wrong. In, in, in some ways that are so obvious now, like, have you seen these colored statues? The, uh, when uh, there's this uh, exhibition that was, uh, I guess, going around the world, I have never seen it in, in, in real life, but I've seen pictures of these statues where they try to uh, use the pigments, uh, the remnants of the uh, pigments on the statue to recreate their original color. Oh. And you look at these, uh, you know, we we, ha we we got used to this idea that the Greco-Roman world is this white marble. Yeah, white marble. And it wasn't. It was really, really weird and colorful. And yeah. so color some of these statues, it, they reliably make me think about DMT. I'm looking at yeah. this, like, green, yellow, red, weird character that's a part of a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a god or something or a hero in this mythological story. It makes me think about DMT, and so you, and 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 we built oh a completely God. different I reality share, based on I that. I have to, I have to share this. I have to share this. So, I'm so excited by what you're saying right now because you know I'm um my personal ethics. I'm using uh, neo stoicism for my personal mm -hmm. ethics. Mm -hmm. It's a great system of ethics. Stoicism is an excellent system of ethics, but I'd, I'd been arguing with everybody because, you know, they neo-Stoics, they don't like to have a God. They don't want right. anything like that. Well, the, the whole word Stoic comes from the Stoa, which is this porch, and it's from the Stoa Pekile, 
I probably pronounced incorrect. This painted porch, and this is this place where the Stoics would, would walk and they would have conversations and debates and dialogues, dialectic and all of that shit. From your description, that Stoa Pekile would have been trippy. It would have been trippy as fuck, right? <laughs> it could now, be. Now, so modern Stoics are like, oh, you just... Like it's almost as though art doesn't exist. It's like mm -hmm. art and religion don't exist when you talk to modern Stoics, and it drives me fucking bonkers because they supposedly are are trying to think about human nature as it is. We're we're capable of reason and we're social. Yes, we're capable of reason and we're social. That's why a guy like John Horgan writes a book like Rational Mysticism. That's why we have aesthetics. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Marcus Aurelius had, a, had an ancient, he had an ancestral shrine that he would burn mm -hmm. incense to and pray to at night. Mm -hmm. We're humans. We're symbolical creatures. You have to use symbols. That's right. what we are as people. But anyway, this whole idea that the that modern Stoics are missing, this whole trippy aspect is very exciting to me. So sorry for interrupting, but I got really ecstatic for a second. Well, again, I, I, I do need to put these ex disclaimers that I don't know enough about any of this to be yeah. to speak about it confidently. But but some I definitely have seen some of these fucking sculptures that look trippy as fuck. Yeah. And uh, it makes sense to me. And I, I often wonder if well you tell me how you uh perceive these ancient religions like of the ancient uh greece or rome or uh egypt i think we do uh, uh look at it mystically uh but you know the way i learned about them when i was little is and this may be a remnant of this like soviet um ideology materialism uh, way of looking at things but i remember it was presented like a long time ago people were you know were observing the these uh events that they couldn't uh explain couldn't understand rationally like the lightning in the sky and they had to make up these stories now we know what lightning is and so we, it, it was this condescending kind of way of looking when back when people didn't know they came up with these stories to talk about uh, to to make sense of the world and I have a strong suspicion that this is missing the point completely. I don't know. I again, I a I'm not educated enough. B when I do find uh, you know like a popular uh, writer historian, most of them I think when when they talk about the ancient Rome or, or ancient Greece, they still have this kind of like you know you you need. To get to to get to a meaning of certain parts of religious worldview, you kind of need to be religious yourself, or you need to have psychedelic experiences or something. You need to get access to that dimension that they're trying to describe that you're trying to relate to. And if you just don't have that, you've never done drugs, you've never meditated, you've never had any peak experience, and your natural disposition is the more of a like very rationalist, materialist kind of person. You're just not gonna understand what people are talking about and i think this happens a lot especially when we're looking at these older cultures we don't know we've never experienced them we kind of piece them together and we try to understand them through our eyes and it's for us it's the easiest way to look at these ancient gods you know mars and and, and people like that as a story but there definitely are other ways of looking at the situation one being uh, let's say you look at these gods as personified principles of the universe or the human world. You have a god of war that's a way of talking about the reality that war is a part of what's going on here. You know, it, my one way of, of um, relating to that uh, way of looking at things for me is just try to imagine a situation where you are a military command commander standing on the top of a hill looking at your army going to battle with a different army and you're looking at all these people dying and you believe that Mars is a real thing. There's a war of God and you're a person who's doing war and you're, you're looking at the deaths occurring and you know that there's like all of this is connected to you for you to um, 
a deity, right? Uh, uh, something that's sacred in some way. It's a consciousness that, that is powerful, more powerful than you are, more powerful than any human. Uh, it's this force that can be represented as a, as a person, but you're also looking at this force in action right now because you're seeing you know, hundreds of people killing each other below your feet and you're the person, you know, the, you're the reason they're there, you're the, the person who gave the command and all the meanwhile, you know, all of this is a part of this divine reality or high reality or uh, spiritual reality. If you try, if that, that, that's, I don't know if I did a good job of, of trying to you know, make that language accessible. And I don't know if that is the language that, uh, you know, I, 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 that is, I kind of made up in my attempts to try to guess or, or, or um, uh, you know, come up with, with another way of looking at these old stories from very advanced civilizations again. again. Um, uh, I don't know if that, that was how they looked at things, but that's a way of looking at things. Uh, and that would be a powerful way of looking at things, I think. A very powerful way to visualize and embody what it is that you need to... to, to... It's only got real quiet. Oh, yeah, sorry, I didn't have it turned up. To, to, to visualize and embody the, the aspiration that you're driving towards through this manifestation of this deity, right. incredibly empowering. I, I pulled this off my shelf, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Oh, I think it, I've read that. He's an interesting guy because he prays to the muses before he writes right. every day, and that's right, how he's right. able to get his basic writing done every day. Is and here's this modern person totally using an ancient technique, pray to right. the muses, and it, that gets him in the mindset, and he's able to to do his daily work. But anyway, I also wanted to say, you know, I think that. This is where Jordan Peterson gets really short shrift in the popular media. Like, right. Peterson, I understand that he's a tool and that he's like a douche for how he got to prominence and everything. But like, he's also the only person that I know of who is an academic with credentials that's legitimately trying to understand what homo sapiens are doing with these myths and religions. Right. Right. Uh, I'm not even going mean, to, I'm was, just going to say that yeah. I'm not going to even blame him for any, like, I, I find it kind of weird that I think in all, almost every conversation that I'm a part of when people bring up Jordan Peterson, they feel this, either they scoff at him uh, or, or if, if you, if people do make, you know, do use some argument of his or, you know, uh, some idea of his that they find uh, or part of his experience, his story that, that is meaningful, important, or he got something right, they feel that they need to point out that they also think he's something, you know, bad about him. And I don't, yeah. I don't really understand why that is the case. It uh, might be a Russian American thing. Our, I think we're all so hypersensitive with like cancel culture and everything. I think we're just like in America right now, if you're not, you really need to posture yourself as being appropriately mm. pro-social justice. And if you don't, you're not doing your job. Uh, so we just, we just, that's just where we're at. I don't, and that maybe there's not that same kind of social justice vibe in Russia. I'm not sure. Oh, there's definitely not a whole lot of social justice in Russia. Yeah, social yeah. Justice vibe. yeah. But there is, you know, we, there is that vibe in certain circles that I think are not very, the, the pussy riot circles or whatever? I, I, well, those are kind of more interesting people, freer people than, uh, that, than let's say like this liberal media that exists. It's not, it's not a force, it's not a big force in the country, in the society, you know, run by Putin and, and you know, the, his system. Uh, but they, they exist as a, I kind of look at them as a subculture, you know, and it's, I don't have any problem with them. Uh, but, um, that social justice, you know, vibes are there. It, it's it. Not only I don't have any problem with them, I I applaud them in some ways. I'm not uh, giving them any any shit, but um, they're not the dominant. Like their reality is not the dominant reality in Russia. Um, 
And uh, what, what am I getting with this? It, I think it's, it, it used to be at least more accepted in public speech. And I think it's going to continue to be accepted, at least in private speech, to have opinions that are wrong or fucked up or like you don't you don't have to be right you don't have your your opinions are not so important for it to matter whether you you're right or wrong you know so it's like you can i think there's a greater tolerance in russia uh towards an opinion you disagree with or even find the pollen you know like if i talk to somebody and i think his views are all kinds of fucked up and evil i don't necessarily hold it against him you know, so you have some fucked up views. What I'm, it may it may put barriers between us, like for us to become close friends or something. But but I'm not gonna be all scandalized about some guy having fucked up views. That, I mean, why why would you expect everybody to have the right views or the views that you consider right? Yeah, we kind of touched on this the last time we talked. There's some weird political identity thing going on in right, the United States right. where it's like and and Bob's doing a lot of work trying to talk about cognitive empathy because we just we just think like if you have the wrong view you're evil period and I need to say you're evil if I don't people are going to identify that I neglected to tell say that you were right. evil uh, and it's <laughs> you know we just don't have that nuance right now like if, if like, well I, th I think it isn't it it, it to me, from the outside, it looks like there's a kind of a, I guess people call it the cultural war, right? But I think there's a, a, a battle for what America is of, uh, you know, people feel like it's very important. It's their civic duty to try to make the definition of America what they think it's supposed to be. And there are competing views that uh, if you know people feel hard and hard to uh, be okay with like if 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 your version of what America is is completely incompatible with mine, you know we're gonna clash in this, but I think it comes from this like competitive nature of uh, the democratic system and capitalism, and it's like it's everything for Americans it seems from the outside is this competition that's how you figure out what reality is or who's right or who's going to go to jail or uh who's a winner who's a loser it's this competitive thing and so for views of what america is compete and compete at, at this point it seems like to death like the main thing it, there, there's not a search for uh a synergy like here i think america is this you think America is that? I wonder if we can come up with a third way that would encompass both. Like that seems to be lacking completely. Um, yeah, and, and again, I think in, in Russia, in Russia, it's not this like really hard competitive thing. I think because most people feel it doesn't fucking matter what I think Russia is or what you think Russia is. We're not ruling here. We're not making the Russian like you'll have this view. I'll have that that view, and it, it doesn't matter at the end of the day because neither you nor I have any power. That's what I'm, so it goes, yes, it's true about the philosophical thing with respect to no, knowledge, self-knowledge of mm -hmm. your power, but it's also a, a market force thing. Right. And so it's like, how do you get people to the polls? You get people to the polls by convincing them that something's at stake. Right. Because if nothing's at stake, why, and, and indeed, many Americans do not vote. Many Americans do not vote. So you get them to the polls by convincing them some evil is upon us. And if we don't right. get to the polls, we're fucked. So you mix that with the fact that um, media is not a publicly owned utility. Media is composed of a shit ton of private companies. So the, those private companies are going to do that. They're going to they're gonna cater to those polarizing forces because that's what's that's how you get audience base that you people aren't going to watch you if you're boring it's just that this just the way it is people don't watch public television if they think it's boring i don't right. you know i i personally love boring media <laughs> i i've been loving boring media 
since well before the podcast revolution. What's but, an um, example of boring media that you like? N- NPR used to be boring. NPR mm. didn't used to be. I, the, the day I stopped listening to NPR was when they canceled a show called Talk of the Nation. It was a morning show that was like an hour or two long. And it was just a guy, Neil Conan, <laughs> and he was Talk of the Nation. I'm Neil Conan. And he said bye-bye when the caller got off the air. And, and it wasn't even a particularly long format show. It was still, they still oh, wow. had to cut things short. But by by today's cable news standards, it was a long form show. It's not long form in comparison to podcasts. But uh-huh. the day they canceled that show, I was like, fuck it. NPR's, it was during, I think it was during Obama's second term. And I was like, it's, they're in the bubble. They're in the the Obama bubble. They they're in the the this specific newosphere, <laughs> or like how, how is that show connected to the bubble? Why why the cancellation of that show uh, means that would be that would be the kind of show where you could have a you'd have one guy from one side talking uh, legitimately about something. I see. Uh, and uh, yeah, and it was also the boring media aspect of it too. It was like you guys aren't. <laughs> it used to be your public radio, you know, it's supposed to be like mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. fact that your tax dollar supported mm-hmm. had something to do with you being a public utility. It's not like that anymore. And I actually know somebody who's in public radio who said when Trump was threatening to cut the funding, they were like, go ahead, cut the funding. We'll, we'll make it up somehow. And I'm like, well, you're not really public anymore. You know? Like, right, 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 right. Um, Interesting. I wanted to to mention a thing to get back to uh you know we were talking about this one way of looking of, of making sense or relating to an ancient worldview a pagan worldview with gods of different parts of life principles of life right and we don't have much of that now but the reason I keep coming back to this Pepe the frog merging morphing into Kek the god of chaos thing is because that is an example like i don't have many more examples of that but i think that is a very promising um what would you call it creative project or something finding these bridges so what kek the god of chaos that looks like a frog in these internet means is is somehow a connection to this ancient magical way of thinking he is an internet meme he is a thing that people laugh at. It's like a joke. It's it's a uh, like jokes travel. Like the other memes travel is just something people share because they giggled. Uh, and it's a personification of Trump in some cases, right? So it has a very direct connection to the political reality. Uh, it's a way of looking at that political reality because if you think, if you look at the president of your country as this living joke that has a connection to an ancient magical worldview that is all about shit posting and provocation and uh, weird kind of irony where you can't figure out whether it's a joke or not anymore, who's being serious and who's not, whether a person posting this particular swastika is a neo-Nazi or a very ironical young man or whatever. It's, it gets all confused. And Trump is a representation of that force that's a way of relating to the political reality that to me is you know is powerful let's say i'm not saying it's good or bad but i'm saying this kind of looking at things this way of looking at things can i think get shit done or or orient you in the political reality in such a way that you then can get shit done you know if you look through this lens as opposed to your old, uh, you know, the polls in Iowa say this, and this, here's how it's going to go, it, this, this like New York Times analysis or CNN analysis of uh, how this, the election is going to go, let's say, or what it means that election went this way or that way. Yeah, I think you're right. Like, I, it can't just all be rational and analytical. People just don't respond to that. They need symbolical. And the closest right. analog I can think of to Keck is Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the reason is she's audiovisual. She does video albums where the chore- choreography is as, actually more important than, than the lyrics. It's like uh-huh. the, the 
set design, the costuming, and it's this whole African consciousness. We right. are at, we are deep in Egypt, you know. So it's any you could put some biblical stuff on top of that, and it's like all of these people, BLM, you know, all of these people together. You know, it's like one thing, one kind of symbolical force. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because she's a person, you know, she exists. Right. I think that might even be her birth name, you know, <laughs> and, but it does, that's not how it functions. It functions as like a comic book character. And I don't mean comic book, like, like Charlie Brown. I mean like graphic novel, like right, 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 mytho symbolical right. figure, right, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, I would say Rogan is doing that with his life interesting uh, right because he is also this and he would say this himself i'm a fucking comic book character i'm you know a, a, <laughs> yeah. a really muscular guy who does dmt is a you know his whole career is su such a weird combination of of things and he's a caricature of a man in some ways like you you take these ideas of masculinity and you put them into this like again a comic book character like a a, a very um what would what would you call it um overemphasized masculinity right yeah, yeah. Uh, and he becomes so that there's joe rogan the man there's a person who has a family who's talking to his children in the evening who's uh, has friends who has private conversations on the phone and all of that i don't have access to that person uh though i get more of an access to that person than with your usual celebrity because he is high talking on his show uh, without filtering his words very much because he's and you see his high. mannerisms and his gestures yeah. and all of that yeah and and there are hours and hours and hours of the of these conversations you can't control yourself for for this many hours um, but he's also like the 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 entity that I do have uh, access to is an image of. Joe Rogan is this guy with a kettlebell and DMT and uh, whatever he's shooting <laughs> arrows. He's the, the first thing you hear when you log on is you hear him doing like a monkey sound. <laughs> right, 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 right. And the UFOs are there. This whole thing is like uh, mixed in there, and and he's also he's also a player. A, a, an agent in the political reality more than many people, right? If he says something on his show that may influence the situation or if he has Look, a man, particular guest on the show. Maybe Trump has this professional wrestling deal, but Joe Rogan's the real thing, man. He's mixed martial arts, man. <laughs> <laughs> so so it's, it's just very interesting. And uh, what am I... There's this idea that I, I've been trying to get at that I can't uh, express or understand fully myself, but I am trying to think about it. And it's the relationship between um, a person and the idea or ideas of a person. Yeah. And you can you can use Trump and Putin as uh, case studies. And my what would you call it, either intuition or a, a thing that I'm excited to explore, a, 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 a proposition that is interesting to at least look at. I'm not, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but I kind of want it to be right, I guess, on the static grounds, is the idea that Putin the man, the actual person, is not a powerful entity, but these ideas of putin are and 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 you can look at that situation like if you try to imagine that like, again like there is a guy who goes to bed at night and he closes his eyes and thoughts go through his head uh you know and he takes a piss in the morning and brushes his teeth like there's a person who's going through the routine of life and uh has all the emotional uh trappings of being a human has all the distractions that that every human has that guy just happened to be in that situation he's in the fucking kremlin for 20 years now he's gonna do more of that and he is less he has less power over the situation than these images of him that he knows of that he can kind of work with play with but 
it's them who are running the show more than he is. Oh, man, we have this thing in our country. Well, first off, you're making me think of the great and powerful Wizard of Oz. Right. I Don't pay so, attention yeah. to the man behind the curtain. Look right. at the fucking media portrayal right. and this magic screen above, which is an amazing... I mean, it's, it's, it's extraordinary how this children's author and this movie company, MGM, figured out this analog or, for, or this metaphor for American media right. culture. Whether they were trying to do that or not, I don't know. But um, we have, that is our, okay, Americans think that we're like these direct democracy people, but Woodrow Wilson <laughs> was sick in bed. And his wife was dealing with everything. His wife was basically mm -hmm. running the country. Uh, FDR, you know, there's questions, you know, at, at the end of his term. And he was in, he was, they were going to put him in for a, a four, fourth term. You know, Reagan was notoriously drunk a lot oh, at really? the end of his presidency. Um, fucking same thing with Nixon. Uh, the Democratic Party nominated a fucking 80 year old as their candidate. They, they, nominated a skeleton he's a figurehead there's no other way to describe joe biden it's mm -hmm. a figurehead he's mm -hmm. not actual presidential material they nominated him so, so that they could get a good vp pick so they can run things after he does his single term presidency it's insane i mean it's uh but anyway that's I just went on a well, why, 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 did, why is that insane? Stuff. Why is that? Why can't that maybe that's be just a how strategy? power works? Yeah, maybe that's just, yeah, it's just how power works. It's like the Pharaoh, man. The you know, you got to have the, the image of the, of the divine king on the side of the, on the side of right. the buildings, right. you know. Uh, people have to have their divine, uh, divine royalty, you know. It, it's, it's interesting, like these different ideas about power and how they're connected to history. And I'm thinking, I think I've, I've mentioned this before, uh, or I definitely mentioned it on, on my podcast in other conversation, this idea in Russia that Putin does not exist. Uh, it's this kind of a, I, I guess a, a meme would be an accurate way to describe it, but not meaning, it is internet memes too, these pictures, but uh, earlier than the internet, this appeared in the culture and it's this idea that you hear, if, from, from this guy here, from that guy there, and it's usually a joke, but every so often it's not a joke, and there are different versions of it, but the premise is that Putin is not real. And I think it can be viewed in so many different ways, all of them making a certain kind of sense, like it can be a, a commentary on this particular guy, Putin, you know, we don't know enough about him, he's this like weird, mysterious character. It's, it was, it started... I remember uh, uh, one of the first kind of memes, these like like viral pieces of uh, formulation of feelings about Putin is when he became, I can't remember if he was elected then already or he was doing this uh, interim term before his first election when Yeltsin left and he put Putin in charge. Um, but there was this, uh, some kind of a summit of Western countries, and one person formulated this question. He said, "We don't know who Mr. Putin is," and he 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 said this in 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 these like we, we, you know with pauses, accentuated accentuating the words. He said, "Who is Mr. Putin?" And it became this kind of headline material, and it became like Russians laughed at it, and uh, it made a ton of sense for us because we had no idea who the fuck Mr. Putin is. He's the president of our country and we were just notified about it, you know, and it's, and uh, maybe it was right after the election. So then uh, there's more, but, but we didn't know him anyway. And we still don't, right? He's not, he's not like the Obama family where here are the kids, here's the dog, here's the wife, they talk, they dance, they, 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 they have this, uh, a version of, of here's you know Obama the person Obama the human he he, he talk like a like a person and again you can say that's a fake personality or not but you can get the feeling that you know who this guy is and with Putin he's always remained kind of ex KGB 
kind of a spy, doing these different, uh, you know, projecting images of himself that were not like a, a person, but like you can relate. No, he's like in taiga, shirtless, uh, saving a tiger or diving deep into the water to find an ancient vase or something. Like, it's Being all... being a flock of geese. Exactly. Cranes, those were, yeah. And so it could be a description, this idea that Putin does not exist. It could be just a, a description of that reality. Like, we don't know who the guy is. Uh, it could be a statement about power. Uh, metaphysically, you know, like, at a deep level, like, had, that's how power works. There is no Putin. There is no uh, demiurge or whatever. It's not, you know, we, we have an image of a person at the top, but it's not the real thing. It could be somewhere in between those two where it's a description of power in Russia, like a political statement that it's the regime that's important and Putin is a person who represents the regime, but if you tw take Putin out, there's going to be a new guy and the system is going to continue, which also would make sense for Russians you know, to adopt that way of thinking of things because when you start talking about Biden as the skeleton uh, you know, uh, of a person. We had a period um, right before Gorbachev, right before the perestroika, where we had like, and after Brezhnev, where we had like three or four people who, you know, the 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 Tsaka, the the head committee of the party, were all of these why all of these old men, really fucking old men, and so when. Uh, the next in in the chain of command got power. He died in a few months, and then he was replaced by another guy who died in a few months, and then he was replaced by another guy who died in a few months. And that person is and you could see them, and and that's after Brezhnev, who already by the end of his term he could barely fucking talk. So you're, if you have, any, it's very hard to think of that person as a powerful person, like this is the leader of our country, when you can see he can barely talk, he doesn't know what's going on, he, uh, they, they, with Chernyenka, they would prop him up, like he, I think by the end of his, um, his stay, he, well, we didn't know that, the, the, the people of the Soviet Union didn't know that, but you can't, you don't need to know the details to still get the reality of the situation, and there is, the situation was that he basically stayed in his bedroom and next to the bedroom they created this kind of a fake office like as if he's working here he, and, and, and he would uh, do, you know, they would record him uh, making some statement or, or, or like they just, there's an old man who can't function and every, every so often you have to pick him up kind of and put him in front of the camera and help him to go, get through the shoot and then he goes back who's running the country it's not it's not that person nobody nobody had any illusion about that person running the country and so then you try to think of well who does run the country and in line with the official soviet ideology marxism you know you can come up with like it's a class or it's here's how the system works it's a less person uh it's less focused on the person than at the structural forces at work, right? And so that can be another way of interpreting this. There is no Putin meme. You know, it's not about him. It's not. It's never about the guy. It's about the system that he represents, uh, or or maybe doesn't even represent. Whatever you can go to different uh, levels of that. But uh, that I guess is another. So I, I have these like little. Um, pieces of what can be a worldview, I think, or a language or a, a comic book. I don't know. You know, like a way, a way of looking at the situation where you have CAC here and that's one part of how you relate to the Trump reality. And there is no Putin as one of the elements of how you can relate to power in Russia. And so that that's kind of like one of the projects that I'm working on uh, just by living and thinking about shit, uh, trying to come up with a language like that that would be just interesting, playful, uh, weird, uh, but also meaningful and would get you 
further uh, in understanding the situation or describing the situation in, in uh, a more full way than, um, you know, our tired old uh, languages. Yeah, I think there's a sort of arca persona, you know, mm -hmm. it's like a, like you were saying, the, the, the identity of the figure versus the identity of the, like, specific historical homo sapien. Right. Um, it's, it's so interesting. Like, I just kept thinking a lot about Obama while I was hearing you talk because it's like I recently watched, um, for anybody who doesn't watch Blogging Heads, um, there are these two um, black academics, John McWhorter and Glenn Lowry. Uh, they call themselves the black guys of Blogging Heads, so I feel okay describing them that way. <laughs> I watched them in 2008 when the Democratic primaries were still going on before Barack Obama had gotten the nomination. And it was head to head between Obama and Hillary Clinton for the Democratic nominee. And um, Glenn Lowry was supporting Hillary Clinton and John McWhorter was supporting Barack Obama. And Glenn was saying, you know, I keep hearing um, people talk to me, say, you know, I've, we've talked to Obama behind the scenes and he's really, he's playing it as he's a centrist, but he's really very progressive. Mm -hmm. And Lowry said, okay, if he's really progressive and he really has this ideology that he's not espousing on the stump, I would kind of like to know what that ideology consists of policy-wise right. and as a legitimate question. Right. So fast forward, uh, it's Obama running for his second term against Mitt Romney. I have mm -hmm. a friend in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, who's a leftist, kind of a progressive, kind of Naderite, kind of green leftist. And he's going to vote for Jill Stein instead of Barack Obama. And you kind of press him on why. And he says, Barack Obama is the best Republican president we've had since Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. Saying Obama is not left at all. He's mm -hmm. not really progressive. He's actually a Republican in Democrats clothing. Then I'm on a bus before Trump. It's like a year before the Trump election. I'm on a bus in Texas going from Tulsa to, to, to I think I'm going to Dow. I, I'm, I'm going to end up in Austin, Texas. I can't remember where my bus was going to end first, but there's this uh, young black man about 26, 28, just got out of prison. He's taking a bus back to his hometown talking about Obama and he said he did more for the gays than he did for us you know like saying Obama's mm -hmm. not a black candidate not mm -hmm. really black then you see Ta-Nehisi Coates after Hillary loses the election to Trump Ta-Nehisi Coates publishes his Obama era essays and the title of his collection of essays is we were eight years in power meaning us black people we mm -hmm. were in power for eight years. He's g giving the opposite identification mm -hmm. of blackness with Obama than this young man just out of mm -hmm. prison was. Big persona, hard to pin down. Obama just gives the nomination for, for Biden. Uh, and he's standing in front of the Constitution. You know, we, we the people, you know, he's got this iconography behind him. I represent the United States, the Constitution, the history, right. you know, is he a traditionalist? Is he a progressive? Is he left? Is he right? Is he black? Is he white? Who knows? But he's Obama. And everybody thinks they know who he is. They, they understand the cadence of his voice. They hear him. They know him when they see him. But can you define who he is? Nope. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting to think what the people themselves I mean, the Obama in this case, Putin in his case, Trump, and what their view of the game is, of what a, their relationship to their persona is. Uh, you know, they, they probably understand it better than we do, looking at it from the outside, right? If, you, if you're the main player, you kind of know what the game is better than uh, somebody trying to figure it out from the outside, maybe. Or, I mean, maybe in, in some cases you get to that's that's kind of like that's one way of looking at things you know I've, I've done some of these um some of the interviews i've done on my show is with tony ortega about scientology and there's a 
an interesting question about Hubbard there, because he is. It's easy to look at him as a con man, because his whole fucking thing is so. I mean, it 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 it, it it's hacky. It's it, you can you can see the dynamics at work, like how it's designed to trick people and get money from people. It's very it's obviously, slick. yeah. But uh, well, Tony's. Uh, description of it and I think he gets it from uh, uh, you know he has all of this information at his fingertips about how the Scientology was from the inside from interviews with the son of, of Hubbard and, and so forth um, it looks like he bought into his own con at some point at least maybe there was always uh, kind of two realities going uh, are you trying to say something with your face no, no, I'm just with you. I'm just with oh, okay. you. I see, okay, yeah. I see this happen with all sorts of people and phenomena. Right. So, so I, I, I don't really know how that real, how his story really, really, you know, went. Whether there's always been two versions of, uh, you know, what is given the followers, and then there's a private version of Scientology that he's using for himself or what. But he um, was doing some of the things he was practicing the techniques that he was given to other people himself. And it, it, it's plausible, at least, to say that he, at some point, bought into his description of what reality is and the world is and how it all works, even though, simultaneously, he was obviously selling this to other people as just a way to make money, as a way to, to, trick, to get power and so forth. And it was obviously... Uh, kind of hallucinatory, meaning like, you know, illusory, a, a thing that you're, uh, a reality you're creating for these people. And so it's interesting to think what Putin thinks about his relationship to the realities that he's creating uh, and what Trump thinks. Uh, in, in case with Trump, it sort of seems that he doesn't intellectualize it so much. It's more of a way of playing the game that he's confident in and it's been working for him um and uh and yeah and with putin we go back to this there is no putin meme because you can come up with different ways of how putin might be looking at the world from very mundane and kind of dumb and simplistic uh to very metaphysical and trippy and weird and He's not giving you much of, um, you know, he's not nudging you one way or the other. So people can come up with ideas of what he, he is and they will all be plausible um, uh, on, on, on their own accord. You know, you, you, we don't know who the guy actually is, what his thinking is like. So, yeah, that, that I don't know what I'm trying to say. I think I'm, 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 in terms of talking about these political realities and power and uh, these situations that we try to navigate, I think I'm lacking... Um, I haven't heard a, a way of looking at power that felt useful to me right now that felt like it's i can just take it and apply I, what i was, here's what i'm trying to say i want a newspaper that would be like the psychedelic new york times of of, of like this vision of your i want i want to go to a place where like what a newspaper is it's like here's what's going on in the world right and you have the front page and you have the stories inside and it's this document that tells you what is going on what the situation is what the reality is like and there is not any outlet like that or, or a presentation of the current events of the day-to-day -day reality or, you know, weekly, monthly kind of basis of things happening in the world that would, would feel to me like it's actually telling the story of what the, the human situation is. It, it's, it, it's these realities that I can't, they're not compelling to me. They're not, I can't, I can't really believe in this because it's either too boring or, obviously wrong or i see the biases of the author to, i only see the biases of the author i'm not seeing a whole lot of else it's just like my side is correct and I, that's not interesting to read and i'm not gonna 
be able to live in this reality, which is the, the whole predicate of it is just there are two sides and my is correct. It, you know, I can't, I can't work with that. And so I want something like this to exist. Uh, I'm not seeing much of it. And I guess the natural kind of uh, outcome of that is me trying to create something like that uh, through my own, you know, writing and drawing and uh, talking, I guess, to you and just, uh, you know, my various creative projects. I'm not anywhere close, but that's the direction in which I'm trying to uh, work and or play. One, one, one way of, of approaching this, I started talking about it earlier and, and didn't, didn't finish the thought, is uh, we talked about panpsychism and John, John Horgan's interview about panpsychism. Uh, I wonder if I can do something, not just with that interview, but take that interview and, take, and talk to John and uh, get his ideas on science reporting and science and these these scientific ways of looking at the world that also, you know, it's one of his big topics that he at, at one point believed that science is going to have the, the answers, that there is going to be a coherent, here's what the world is, here's what consciousness is, and here's why we understand it this way. But instead, we have this um, balkanization of, uh, of, of worldviews in science, from panpsychism to the superstring theory to... Uh, the multiverse, like all of these various approaches that don't seem to be convergent, or at least that, that's a, his way of looking at things. They, they're not convergent, they're, they're going in, in these uh, opposite directions or, or multiple directions, and he concludes uh, partly from that um, that uh, science is not going to give us this you know, description of what the reality is. And so you just have many different stories and you can you know, you, you have to figure out your own way of uh, picking one or collecting uh, two into one or whatever, or, or uh, devising your own. Um, but what I want to do is to talk to him about all of this stuff and maybe some particular news from the science world, uh, maybe try to connect it somehow to politics or whatever and just make this one issue of psychopolitica, which would feel like you're getting that you're kind of browsing through that kind of psychedelic New York Times, like metaphysical news. Like here's what, here's what we think reality is according to the latest uh, findings in science. Yeah. Here's these different, and, and, and if you, I, I'm not going to make the actual thing, like I'm not going to run a newspaper. I'm not going to create a media outlet, but if I can make an image of one for this uh, yeah. one issue that. Uh, in some ways would be enough for me because that gets at the idea that that thing is possible. If that magazine existed, it would make a lot of sense and would be interesting to read and you would, you know, unsubscribe from all, the, all this bullshit that uh, you can't subscribe for money and instead subscribe to this thing. And it would be just the idea that this kind of way of talking about reality and uh, current events uh, is possible that itself has value for me. And so that, that's one of the things that I have in, in mind uh, now. Your vibe is definitely working in that direction. I mean, the look of your newsletter definitely has this kind of meta vibe. It's almost like you're looking at a newspaper as represented in a graphic novel or something. Right, 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 right. I, yeah, that's, I've, I haven't thought about that particular image, but I remember loving this kind of shit in, I think in, in The Watchmen there is something like that. Where I need in, to check that out. I've heard so many good recommendations for Watchmen. Oh, it's really good. Uh, the graphic novel was... I, I like the movie too, but uh, I read the graphic novel after I watched the movie. And uh, I, uh, I thought it was just great. And I usually... like I, I, I don't know. I've finished maybe two comic books. Like That's not the medium that I'm... That's not native to me. Not, not, yeah, not me comfortable neither. usually. But that one was really, uh, really, really great. Well, hey, Nikita, this has been an amazing conversation. Um, same here, yeah. Totally unexpected for me as well. I, uh, 
haven't been up front also that I was a bit high before we started. <laughs> I don't know at which point, <laughs> at which point <laughs> and whether I've gotten totally to my sober self. And that, that's on top of being kind of hungover from the, from the night before. That's all I but, can hope for as a as an interviewer <laughs> that I can lead someone towards sobriety. <laughs> well, yeah, but uh, yeah, unexpected, unexpected for me because I thought we we're just gonna like chat privately. But, but by the way, I still want to talk to you about some um, like practical ideas oh, a bunch of stuff for to work. 